now. Welcome to the Learn to Judge Beer live stream. Pour yourself a beer and join in as we cover everything from assessing and scoring beer through to identifying and fixing faults. Welcome back. Can you hear me, everyone? Let's see in the chat if you can, because I know last week YouTube didn't start the audio straight away, and we don't want that happening this time. So, sound? Yes? No? Yes. Cool. We have sound this week. That's good. All right. I want to start the week off by saying a couple of thank yous. First off, thank you to Rich, my co-host, who's back with me again this week. So, if you don't remember Rich, there he is. And I've got to thank two folks who've got voluntold to be mods in the chat for me. Because I found out quickly last week that managing all the tech, judging beer, drinking beer, and trying to talk sense all at once is difficult. So, Dan Walters and Reese Davis will be along as soon as the polling stations let him do his business. They're the mods in the chat, so thank you so much to them. But more importantly, thank you to you. If you weren't here, there'd be no point us doing this. So thanks a lot. We're all on form. We're all here for a beer. Very quiet, someone's just said. Let's just turn that up a bit and see if we can make it a bit better for you. How's that? That's uh, that's right up the top of the yellow now. Is that good? Don't know. You let me know. Very quiet. Yes, we can hear you. Can hear fine. Yeah, that's hearing loud and clear. Okay. Yeah, we'll say that's good. Oh, very quiet. Still coming through. Right. Let's um. Let's just pop it even more and push it into the red, shall we? There we go, we're pushing it all the way up into the red now. I don't want to go anymore because the system will start clipping and you'll just hear terrible noise. Volume's okay here, better. Right, sorted. Glad the tech's sorted, let's talk beer. Right, um, so last week we did an introduction, um, some basic tips about tasting, some basic tips about the score sheet, things like that. What I thought I'd do this week is just start off by saying that whilst Richard and myself are both BJCP judges, and that's a lot of what we're talking about with the score sheets, that's not the only route into beer judging. Um, do you want to talk about the Guild briefly, Richard? Uh, so, yeah, there's a work that the other organisation, the first organisation to talk about is an older British one that spun out of our 1970s wave of homebrew clubs uh, called the National Guild of Wine and Beer Judges. They are quite wine, homebrew wine focused, but also do beer. Um, they have their own set of guidelines and run uh, events. A, a lot around things like country fairs, but they also have a big event they run every year. Cool, so that's the Guild. There's also the Cicerone Programme, which is another American focused organization that's aimed more at professional beer drinkers, servers, uh, but they're also now getting bigger and bigger around the world as well. So they're the three main organizations that can get you some sort of certification as a beer judge in this country. Now, obviously, in other countries, there may be different things. Like I know in Norway, for instance, there's no active BJCP judges because they've got their own thing going on. So if you're coming here from outside the UK, you may have to do a little research to find out what's available to you. Right, um, there was a couple of things I thought it would be a good idea to talk about, and I've lost my notes. Where were they? What was it? Oh yeah, the guidelines. I had some notes here on the guidelines which went something like this. It's important that you actually look at the guidelines and understand what they're telling you. Because in some sections, there's an introduction at the top of the section, which has to be understood because it will tell you exactly what is and isn't in style for all the beers that come under that section. If you look, for instance, at um, category 27 onwards, there's normally an introduction telling you what puts a beer into or out of style for the categories that's there. So whenever you're going to judge 
beer or enter beer. Look at the style guidelines, read the introduction to the numbered section that you're thinking of putting your beer in and the actual style, which is the number and letter, and make sure that the beer you're trying to put in fits into the style where you think it does. Uh, did you have any tips on that, Richard? I think, I think you've covered the bit that's important is, is to read, especially on the later ones or any ones that have special entry rules like fruit beers or wild and sours uh, about all the way through the category stack. So start at the top and work the way down to the one that style you're actually looking for. Um, and also a bit of advice that came out in a judging session earlier this week was with beers with special ingredients in them, especially some fruit, mention it even if you're not calling it a fruit beer of that style. So say you put grapefruit in an IPA, you should always write that down because some people have strong reactions to grapefruit. Um, so just put those ingredients down, maybe just in one of the note sections on the entry, uh, just so people are safe. Yeah, totally makes sense. And that's a very valid point. Um, if you are thinking of sitting a BJP exam, uh, Richard will just tell us what the exam's like in a minute. But there's the thing to remember there is that the BJCP tasting exam, you should only see beers from categories 1 to 26. Uh, you shouldn't see any of the specialty beers from 27 onwards served to you at the exam. If you do, the organiser of the exams, um, making it harder for you than they should, should we say. Um, did you want to cover what the basis of the tasting exam is like, Richard? Yeah, so the, to get the, the, the BJCB beer judging qualification, the first thing you end up doing when you're ready, is an online questions exam that we will probably talk about in a later session. Uh, once you've passed that, you've got basically a year to do a tasting exam. There'll be probably about 20 of you doing the tasting exam together somewhere around that region. Um, and what you'll do is you'll go to a place, you'll all sit down and you'll be served a series of beers. This exam is closed book. You're not allowed to take the guidelines in with you. Um, so you have to remember what the beers are and what you're expecting. Uh, usually there'll be six beers uh, that you score. You fill in a score sheet. It's a slightly modified version of the usual one. It's basically free text. Um, you just write in all your tasting, or try and fill out the boxes as much as possible. Sarah will cover the score sheet a bit more in a second. Um, you go through these six beers. There'll be a couple of experienced judges there acting who are called the proctors. Um, they're there to provide the, the good quality score sheets that yours will be compared against. Um, so they'll score the, the, the beers exactly the same process as you are, um, and then the score sheets will get sent off and dealt with. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so the six beers, is quite interesting to talk about them a bit. Usually they'll follow a fairly stormal pattern. There'll be three beers, and so maybe homebrewed, maybe pro-brewed, will be just sort of middle-of-the-road decent beers. There'll probably be one that's got a floor of some kind, um, maybe done on purpose, maybe faked up, maybe it's a bad homebrew batch. Um, there will probably be one that's miscategorized. This is not a guarantee that there'll be definitely be one that's miscategorized, but probably will be one that's miscategorized. Uh, and there'll probably be a classic example of the style. Um, so, for example, uh, when I did the exam, we got a being described as a Helles, was actually through Kolsch. Um, I said it was a Pills, but it's close enough. I got it was out of category. Um, we got uh, Fuller's ESB with lactic acid added to it, which actually made it taste better. Uh, but it was hardly detectable. Uh, we got a Saison, a homebrew Saison, um, an English IBA, IPA, a Baltic Porter, and a US Barley wine, which was Bigfoot, which is a classic example. So that's the sort of thing you'd expect. Um, and yeah, they, you fill in the score sheets, they all get collected up. You talk about it for a bit with the proctors. Um, and, then, and then we go through the process of getting the score sheets marked cool um i've sat the tasting exam twice the second time i had it we had a best bitter i don't think it it wasn't the fuller's one there was another one but it had been laced with vodka to make it too alcoholic unfortunately hardly anyone picked up on it including the proctors so we got away with that one but yeah there's normally that doctored beer to look out for if you're on the six beer and haven't seen it then um you may have missed it or it may not have been in there 
Yeah, it, it sometimes goes through. I mean, the, the tasting exam I ran, I put in some of my uh, Imperial Russian style. All the previous six bottles have been really badly oxidised. <laughs> The two I put in the exam were gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, what a waste of Imperial Russian style. <laughs> right, um, so, yeah, read the section introductions. 1 to 26 of the categories that should be in the exam. When you're looking at the guidelines, note that it will, it will use language like may or can to highlight optional elements. Uh, must or should are required elements and must not or inappropriate cannot be present without you flagging them up as inappropriate for the style. So when you're filling in your score sheet, especially at the exam, they're the things to note from your memory. What must be in a style, what must not be in it. The other thing with the exam, and we've looked at um, the score sheet before, so you can see all the way down the left-hand side here, you've got these handy descriptions of faults that may appear. In the exam, you won't have the descriptions there because that's too handy to remind you what they are. You will literally just have a tick box saying acetaldehyde, it's alcoholic, it's astringent or whatever. So make sure you remember what the faults are. And that's one of the good things if you can get on an in-person training session, an exam prep course, because you will do an off-flavour session. And the in-person off-flavour session is great for building up uh, your mental memory and pictures of what each off flavor is like. Rich, I think you did a session at um, Brucon Leeds, was it, on creating your own yeah. off-flavours at home? Yeah, so you can buy, you buy, the, you can buy these kits. If you're running a, a judge training course, then you get a bit of money off them, but you can fake up a lot of these flavors yourself. Um, so acetic acid is basically vinegar. Um, you can get lactic acid. You probably have it for brewing uh, to get that as an off flavor. Um, and there's a few, there's a few others you can do easily. Um, don't try and put cook corn and things into your beer to get um, that as an off flavor. It just doesn't work. <laughs> Very valid point. Um, okay, so the other thing to bear in mind, unless it specifically says in the style guideline that DMS, cooked corn, is allowed in that style or diacetyl or whatever, then it is always out of style for all styles that don't explicitly say it's allowed. Uh, if you're not sure what some of these terms we're talking about are, there's a link down below to the 2015 guidelines. And there's a handy glossary of a lot of these terms starting on page IX, which is what, nine? I think nine in Roman numerals instead of nine the number. Um, so, yeah, there you go. The If you're doing the exam, the scoring rubric for how it's going to get marked by the graders is actually a public document. So I believe I've also put that down in the description. If I haven't, I'll add it after the show. And you can have a look and see how your exams are going to get graded. Some of the points that I want to pull out of there that you will get marked on is how close your score is to the consensus score that the proctors have given it. You have to be within seven points if you want to get the 60% pass mark for the scoring accuracy section of your grade. Uh, if you're more adrift than that, you'll get less than 60% for that per, but you might make it up on another because 60% is the pass mark overall. Uh, how well your perception of the beer matches the proctors. So if they were like uh, saying things like they got honey, they got um, intense tropical aromas, their perception of the beer will be compared to yours. Also, your perception will be compared to everyone else sitting the exam with you. And if the majority of people picked up what you're getting, be that the other examinees or the great or the proctors, then you'll score well for that. If you miss a lot of things, then you won't score as well for perceptive ability. Uh, descriptive ability, how well you describe the things you got in there. Did what you say on there match? what other people were using to describe the beer. Uh, feedback quality and appropriateness for scores, faults and style issues. Uh, 
If you're giving feedback to a brewer and saying um, this beer needs more um, more body, for instance, and you're then telling them to do something that's actually going to reduce the body in your feedback, then you'll do bad. And this is where brewers really do better than non-brewers as a beer judge because you've got a lot better understanding normally of the process and how the beer is made. And without that, it makes it quite difficult to give good feedback unless you've done a lot of study without the practice. And finally, the other point I wanted to make on that, and we'll get to some beer shortly, which I'm sure will cheer everyone up. Let's hear it for the beer. Um, the completeness of the score sheet, all the elements that you describe. I briefly hinted at it last time, but if you leave blank lines on that sheet, you can lose up to four points a sheet that you fill in. So over six beers, you can lose 24 points just from not filling in all the lines on the, sh on the sheet. So make sure you use the space and not just with big letters. One, one thing on that, though, is in the score sheet, you don't usually have the check boxes for off, off flavours. Like you can then, rather than not having the check boxes, fill in the space by saying no off flavour, no off flavour, no off flavour. It's, it is worth, worth considering if you run out of things to say. Yeah. Definitely. It's always good to comment on what's not there as well as what is. And like Rich says, it does help fill the space. Right. Uh, was there was something else we wanted to talk about before the beer, Rich? I can't remember. I think that was it. Should we get on to the important stuff? Yeah, let's do it, shall we? OK, everyone got a beer? So this week, Jaipur. Uh, new camera, it's not focusing uh so you can get it in cans or bottles depending where you got it from now i'm going to put the style guide up for english ipa which is that one there so we can see what we're looking for with this beer so straight away, first thing we're going to do is get into the aroma, as we talked about last week. And what I want people to do is start writing in the chat what they're getting. And if you look at the chat, you can learn a lot from what other people are saying there. I know when I first ran a training course for judges, I learned a lot from other people's perceptions and the way they were describing things in ways I hadn't personally thought of, and some things started to click for me. So let's hear in the chat what everyone's getting from the aroma on this one and take it from there. So, interesting can, not a full yeah. wrap label. Yeah, there's quite a lot of variation in the Jaipur cans. Some are printed, some have labels on them, um, which is, I don't know what, why there's a difference. Yeah, I don't know. This, this one has got like a sticky label stuck over the top of a plain silver can. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got bread, biscuit and oranges. As a starter, yeah, I could definitely go with go with oranges, and there's a little bit of bread and biscuit. Yeah, I I can go with that as well. Yeah, it says uh, India Pale Ale on the can. It doesn't actually say American on mine, uh, but it is actually an exemplar of the English IPA style. If you look at the commercial examples of the beer. Uh, so that was in response to Richard's comment where it says, so he's obviously got another type of can that says American IPA. So I think it's worth pointing out here that this is, with any style, there's a range of beers that fit into it. And this one is right up this end in between English and American. It's heaps of American hops in this beer. Uh, but it is classed as by the BJCP in the style guide as an English IPA. But it's at that crossover point where a lot of the characteristics you'll get would also fit in the American IPA category. Yeah, this one is definitely arguable which category it fits into. Yeah. Uh, there are things from the English IPA that I think are missing. No, other people seem to be getting ones that I don't pick up. 
Um, but there are, there are also things that don't quite fit in American either. Yeah, it's it's a weird one. So people are getting things like Clementine, uh, Donahue, or Donna. Sorry if I get your pronunciation wrong. It's a floral hop character for me. Uh, Matt Cliff got some sulfur from the first can. Um, this one doesn't have that, so it does sound like there's a bit of variability in the cans. But ideally, what we're looking for here is uh, moderately high hop aroma, floral, spicy peppery or citrus orange in nature is typical. So we're definitely seeing quite a few people pulling that out. There's a citrus orangey note there of some nature, whether it comes across to you as tangerine, um, mandarin. It's definitely got that citrus orange here. It's a little bit pithy for me, uh, but it is there. Uh, grassy dry hop aroma is acceptable, but not required. Anyone getting any grassy on it? I'm not personally, but everyone's got different things they're sensitive to. They detect better or less than other people. Yeah, I definitely get the grassiness on, on this example. Uh, and it's a bit more to the floral than the the, um, the the citrus, though that's obviously still there. Okay, um, Dr. Sam's got an interesting point. Really interesting. I wasn't getting orange, but on a deeper sniff, I'm getting orange verging on chocolate orange. And I would say this is one of the things we try to be careful about when we're judging beer. Because there's very much this ability to influence what other people are getting through suggestion. I've been in a room with other judges where they're judging other beers, not the one we're judging. And someone's saying, God, this beer gives me and then reels off some sort of sensory profile be it an off flavor or whatever and suddenly i start smelling it in my beer even though it's a very different beer to the one they're judging in a completely different style so we do tend to try and watch out for that as we're judging beer um fuggles i see mentioned <laughs> uh where were we yes a little grass so and some people getting no grass. So it does sound like there's a lot of variation in these cans to me because um, I've drunk beer with Richard. I know uh, palates are, are both quite attuned and he's getting grass, I'm not. So it's like, I think there might be some can variability. This beer also changes a lot with temperature. Um, I've noticed if I taste this colder, that all the malt just vanishes as do some of the hot stuff that just changes a bit. So it may just be what temperature people have their beers at. It could well do. Um, mine's probably about 11 or 12 now. I pulled it out of the fridge, which I kept the beer fridge at nine. So I, I had some time for it to sit on the side before we got into it. But yeah, definitely the colder it is, it will give you different characteristics. And as Rich mentioned last week, you can warm your beer up, hold your hands around it, um, and see how the flavour and aroma develops as the beer warms. Uh, I, miss, I think on cask, it tastes more of the English IPA, says Reese. It's a very valid point. Yeah, I think that the difference in carbonation can make it quite... It, well, it is a different experience on cask. Um. Very much so. Okay, so that's aroma. And it does mention actually there that some of them may have a slight sulfury note. So if you picked up sulfur, yeah, I, I'd say you've done well. I'm, I'm getting that there. It's not your imagination at all. Um, Shall we move on to appearance then? So... Colour ranges from golden to deep amber. Yeah, I always struggle with that. Is that like a deep yellow? Is it a, yeah. a is it a deep straw? Is it a light gold? So I mean, I've I've always had trouble with that bit, but I'd say yeah, I could accept that as being a golden sort of colour. Yeah, but my 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 interesting thing if you look at the 
um, SRM numbers at the bottom, it's, it, I think it's quite pale because six is actually quite a, quite a moderate gold colour. Um, you probably you won't be able to pull this out properly. He says trying to wave it in the right place. But six, so six is, is between the two. On, yeah. 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 Um, of, um, yeah, I'd so, say it's more like three on that scale for a guess. Um, but it does depend how light the room you're judging it yeah. in is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it looks quite bright for me. Looking at your picture of it, it looked a little bit darker. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of it. It's going to be the cameras here anyway. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Matt says he's started getting malt now, which is good. Um as for the appearance, uh, Nicholas is saying pale gold, exceptional clarity. Yeah. I mean, I can literally read the web page through that. So, I mean, that is as that is as clear as you're going to get. There's another temperature thing on this, because I think I've had this beer have a distinct chill haze before. If you've got it down like six degrees or somewhere, it does get quite hazy. So it's always worth note that, then warm it up and see what happens. Yep, definitely. Uh, this one's been open a while, so the head's all gone now, but it did pour with a decent moderate-sized head. It did hang around for a bit, um, but I've been waving it around a lot, and it's gone now. All right, golden yellow, mine straight off the shelf at Tesco's. And, yes, yeah, Stu H just said something that's, um, that matched my... Uh, view just then sort of mine looks paler uh yours looks more amber and mine looks more straw so whether that's a can variation or just the lighting and the cameras which is quite likely um yeah a very good point from reese there don't worry about the what the bottle or can says brewers can call it whatever they like and not necessarily to be jcp style and that's a very valid point that comes back to what i said last week the styles don't in any way dictate what a beer is what you can brew or what can go into a beer they are there literally as an aid to judge homebrew competitions that is it that is their sole purpose in life other people have put them to other uses they do make a handy descriptive language when you're talking about beer with other people who know the styles. So, for instance, you can walk into a bar and look at a beer you've never had before and say, what style's that? And get some idea what it will be like. But a lot of what brewers brew and call one style actually isn't. Uh, we started it off with a couple of good examples that are... Uh, specific to one style or another later on through the series as we get through other episodes we'll come to beers that don't fit neatly into one style or another or where the brewer claims it's one thing but it's actually something quite different when it comes to what the styles describe but honestly unless you are judging a competition or aiming to sit an exam don't get too hung up on what the styles say on a can or on the guide because often as far as commercial brewers go they won't match before we go any further i just want to stop everyone and just say please if you are finding any of this useful or interesting please just click the thumbs up down below i'm a small channel and every like you give helps other people find these videos and if you're finding it useful, I'm sure other people will. So anyway, sorry for interrupting the beer. Let's get back to that. So, aroma and appearance. Does anyone want to have a crack at scoring for aroma? See what you think this would score for aroma in a competition. Bearing in mind what is expected and out of 12 points, Put in the chat, please, what you think this beer would get for aroma. Oh, 
And what we'll do then, we'll uh, we'll see how people's impressions of it compare. So we're seeing a 10 from Herman Brewing. Uh, whilst we're waiting, Eugene's asked a question that's quite relevant. Is there a specific lighting you need when judging beers? No, it's best to have some natural light. If you haven't, use what you've got. I'll normally just use the torch on my phone. Yeah, it's quite hard to, to judge in the dark, but yeah, a torch if you need it for doing colour does work. And in things like stouts, you quite often need something like that just to get if there is if it is clear or if there are any coloured highlights in it that are worth mentioning. Yeah, with the lighter beers, it's normally quite easy to see if it's cloudy or got floaters. With the ones full of dirk malt, some of them are surprisingly clear if you shine a light through them. Uh, Dan says, quite easy drinking for a 5.9. It is indeed. Uh, unfortunately, so was the Duval last week as well. <laughs> right, what are we looking at? So we got 10s from Alan and Alan. Uh, 11 from Chris Pritchard. Dr. Sam says 9. Uh, a 12 from Steve Tucker. That's That's the highest I've seen. Uh, lowest I've seen so far is an eight from Hughes Brews. There's a seven from Nathan Edwards. Yeah, seven down there. Uh, Rob's given it a nine to ten. So we're going for somewhere between a seven and a twelve. Most people seem to be hitting the nine to ten sort of mark. And yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Uh, it isn't a perfect example of everything that's in the aroma but it hits nearly everything that's there so uh appearance you've got three points for appearance what do people think it should get for an appearance uh by the sounds of it uh from what richard said if you've got some chill haze you might have a different score to other people Depending how clean your glass was, you might have a different impression of whether you had a persistent head or any head at all. Um, and Richard did flag that up last week. A lot of the time, if your glass is not beer clean, then it will affect the head stand. So, yeah, we're getting some threes coming Four. in. <laughs> four out of three it does look good i'll give you that yeah i'm still getting a bit of lag over you by the look of it even if i'm watching it in youtube instead of h2r graphics uh a two from robert slightly too light yeah that's a that's a reasonable yeah. call yeah i think that's a very good call actually and and it's good if you were uh, if you're not giving it full marks, you should be able to give some sort of rationale behind that. So saying two, slightly too light, is brilliant as far as I'm concerned. That's exactly the sort of thing I'll be looking for to explain it as an organiser of a comp. I'm not a grader. Uh, hands up in the air. Full respect to graders. They do a very tough job. They do it very well. I am a competition organiser. And I do look at most of the sheets that judges submit when I'm scanning them and sending them out to competitors or entrants, depending how you view it. And that's exactly the sort of rationale I'd like to see on the score sheet that goes back to the end user. Here's your score and here's why. And again, if you're doing an exam, that is still very much, um, that's still very much required. If you're docking points, you need to say why. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, if you do, as a, as a competitor, get a score sheet with some dodgy stuff on it. We have had some very bad ones in the past. They're generally a lot better now. Just let the organiser know so they can have a word with the judge to make sure they do it better in the future. Yeah, definitely. Please do. We've had, uh, we've had an occasion at the UK National in the past where a sheet was flagged up 
and um, the organiser went and had words with the judge who decided that they were no longer going to judge. That was their decision. Um, there were some people that I don't invite back to judge at the Welsh because of feedback they've given in the past. Uh, if if you're there to judge beer, you're there to try and help people brew better beer and give them some decent constructive feedback on what they've entered. And if you're not doing that, then as an organiser, it's not worth me inviting you back because you're not providing anything that the competitors or the entrants value in return for what they've what they've done. Uh, what would you say to clean glasses in to keep the head better? Yeah, if your beers, if your glass is totally clean, then that's the best chance you've got of retaining any head. Uh, if it's dirty, then what you'll find is a lot of the time you don't even get ahead in the first place. Uh, quite often you'll see people sharing pictures of beer online on social media and the glass down here is all full of bubbles stuck to the side. If if you see that, all these bubbles stuck down here, that's a 100% indicator that your glass is not properly clean. Um, so, yeah, you start seeing some more rebellious groups that people end up responding to co pictures like that saying clean your glass you manky git and things like that which isn't the best way to put it but it's true clean glasses give you the best head uh, apparently well said i'm not sure what that was in response to <laughs> uh, best glass cleaning technique says steve tucker um Personally, I did a video on this a while back. I use elbow grease and then just rinse it with some Aero water. If you're using... <laughs> Let me put that again. The glasses we use to judge the Welsh get hand scrubbed and then rinse with some Aero water before being left to dry and then put away. Uh, my glasses go in the dishwasher. Um... <laughs> But yeah, it's, it is important. If you're using some detergents that can leave a coating on the glass, then you can end up getting aroma problems or head retention problems. Uh, Rich Swindells uses VPW or OxyClean to clean glasses. There are the good options. Yeah. And other glasses can be quite hard to get inside to, to clean them properly. So yeah, chemistry can always help. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, Dan's on about that video. Yeah, I did put one out um, back in the day. Oh, gosh, that was, what, the first year I did the Welsh, I think. So, yeah, right, let's move on to flavour, shall we? Uh, right, get stuck in. Okay, so we're looking for a medium to high hop flavour with a moderate to assertive hop bitterness. Hop flavour should be similar to the aroma, so if you got floral, spicy, peppery, or citrus, orange, or grassy, you should get that in the flavour as well. Malt flavour should be medium, low to medium. Be somewhat bready, which is something someone brought up earlier. Optionally, with a light to medium, like biscuit, like toasty, toffee, like or caramelly aspects, and again, biscuit was also called out earlier. A medium low to medium fruitiness, and the finish is medium dry to very dry. Uh, it's a little soapy, says. Uh, says someone there, uh, Alan Manley. I just use water for the competition glasses. Right, uh, the, the balance is towards the... Oh, sorry, finishes medium dry and bitterness may linger into the aftertaste, but should not be harsh. So if you joined us last week, we did talk about how the flavour of the beer can develop into the aftertaste and be quite different to what you get up front when you first take uh, the beer into your mouth. If you haven't seen last week's, when this is up on YouTube and not alive, then I'll 
put a link down down in the description to last week so you can go back and watch that where we did the whole introduction to tasting because there was a lot of good stuff there that really helps. Uh, the, the balance is towards the hops, but the malt should still be noticeable in support. If high sulfate water is used, a distinctively minerally dry finish with some sulfur flavour and a lingering bitterness is usually present. Some clean alcohol flavour can be noted in stronger versions and oak is inappropriate in this style. So there's that inappropriate word. What you'll find is nearly every style, if it's got oak or wood, it should be in the wood aged beers unless it's a style that specifically allows for it. So, what are people getting from the flavour? Over we've to the chat. Couple, we've got a couple of people talking about bread and, and bread-like flavours. It's often interesting to try and get a bit deeper into that, of what sort of bread and what bit of the bread. So is it bread crust? Is it just the normal middle of the bread? Brown bread, seeded, white? There's a whole load of bread out there that tastes different. And you can just dive in a little bit more detail in there, which is nice to do. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And the other one that um, you you won't hear in this style, but the other one that's quite common is toast, is one that people talk about in other styles, toasted bread. Once again, you can go and visit lightly toasted, darkly toasted, on mm -hmm. fire. Um, what, level of, what level of toast is it? And what was the base bread again? Yeah, so Tom's there with high hop flavour for sure. I get pithy orange dominating, very strong. Piney, the malt is there in the background. And yeah, I agree. It, it's nice. A lot of people, when they try beer, especially when they first start doing it, will stop at orange or stop at citrus. And it's nice to go that bit deeper and say, yes, it's orange, whether it's a sweet orange or a bitter orange whether it's the white pithy bits of it. So it's always good to give more detail rather than less. Um, and it helps you then describe that beer better to people who may never have tried the beer themselves. Uh, the malt is kind of noticeable, which is good. Definitely not getting any oak or wood. That's good. Yep. Um, that's good because that would knock it out of style uh, Matt Ellis is getting a reasonable level of bitterness the hop is there but less citrus fruity in flavour versus aroma getting little by way of maltiness definitely not toffee or caramel we've got a few people that have come up with floral again which is always an interesting one to try and get deeper into. I mean, I'm, I don't go around sniffing flowers all the time, but a few of them you can, you are sort of familiar, like maybe rose is obviously very familiar, maybe jasmine and a few others. Um, if you can get further into it, then so much the better, merrier. But yeah, it's a hard one to get deeper into, unless you're a, a flower expert. Yeah, it's, it's one of the ones that usually get expounded on less. Yeah. Uh, but whenever you can, it is always good to do it. Uh, so there was a nice comment from David. It was white bread crust, not toasted. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, Eugene, all citrus, no biscuit or malt coming forwards. There's definitely some malt in mine. It's not intense by any means. Um, as Richard mentioned, temperature does play a large part in how you perceive the malt in this particular beer. Uh, Paul needs to get a third can. I hope you bought the four <laughs> pack then. Um, <laughs> it's another good evening for somebody. <laughs> yeah. Some, someone's going to have a good uh, a good Thursday, even if they don't have a good Friday morning. Uh, because what was it? It was over five, wasn't it? 5.9%. 5 something, yeah. Right. Uh, Sam's not getting much malt or bread at all. Um, as as we've said, I, I get some. I'm not getting a lot. It's expected, uh, where was it? Malt flavour should be medium low to medium. I'd say it's about medium low. I wouldn't say it's any higher than that in mine. Um, what other people are detecting, 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's, okay. a, that's a good point. Uh, when we're talking about these these various flavors you're detecting, if we can try, we, we try and categorize them usually low, medium, high with sort of low, medium, or medium, low, and, and intermediate levels on them. So there's like five or six levels there. There are a couple of categories that have levels like outrageous, which I believe is an American IPA <laughs> on the bottom. Um, or maybe bitterness. And then, well, I think it's American IPA that has that in. Uh, but usually it's low, medium, high, and there's the ones in between. Chinoto. <laughs> Chinoto citrus. I'm not sure what that is, but it sounds good to me. All right. Uh, I saw a good one then. What was it? Rich. Rich has put a good one up. Sweet malt with light bread crust, moderately high resinous pine hop flavour, moderately high bitterness, carries through from hops with a light honey melon lingering in the aftertaste. And I think that is a lovely description, Richard. That hits all the points we're looking for. It gives you, uh, th going back to last week again, it gives you what what type and how much of each of the things in there. So there's a moderately high bitterness. Um, it's a light honey melon. It's lingering into the aftertaste. So it's lovely descriptive phrases that help you build a mental picture of this beer. Uh, Herman's on can four and it's a breeze mm. compared to the two <laughs> So, yeah, when we're judging beers, this is from someone's question. Uh, we do tend to judge them all at pretty much the same temperature. Uh, each competition will ha usually have one place where they're storing the beer, hopefully a cold store of some kind. Um, but, yes, we will be almost always judging even lagers at the same temperature as English ales, same temperature as American. And as a judge, you try and take that into account, um, that you're out from where the normal temperature is as best you can. But they're all the same, so the perception of all is the same. Okay, Dr. Sam asked a good one. How do you approach lingering tastes in beer? I've got lingering tastes on my palate. At competition, we will normally have some sort of palate cleansers. On each table, there will always be water for drinking, and there will normally be either crackers or bread or something like that. Um, there's some debate in the judging world about uh, crackers or bread, the best things to use, when they're some of the descriptors you're looking for in some of the styles anyway. And I can totally see the validity in that. If you've got um, water biscuits is the common one that we use for the Welsh. If you've got crackers on the table and you're also trying to get cracker sort of aromas in beer, it could carry over. Maybe for that, those styles, you need a different palate cleanser on the table. But yeah, that's how we deal with lingering tastes. Uh, Rich spoke to lingering aromas last time. Yeah, so yeah, as I said last time, just sniff something non-beer smelling. Usually your clothes is the classic example. Uh, Dan says that Rich Swindells is on fire tonight, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, fair dues. Uh, his descriptors are very good. Uh, Alan Manley says water biscuits all the way. Yeah, yeah I sometimes have a uh, problem with competitions of just nibbling biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, especially by the time you get to the afternoon session, um, you do tend to get through more. You need something to just try and absorb some of the alcohol, I think. Um, Jerry mentions dollar kebabs as a, as a palate cleanser. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is actually becoming a bit of a challenge that... <laughs> A bit of a change at newer, more recent competitions where we're getting nice food for lunch. <laughs> it's actually quite highly flavoured rather than the usual Tesco sandwiches. Um, but you need to spend a little bit of time sorting your palate out after having your nice, spicy, whatever it was, sandwich for lunch. Um, <laughs> yeah, that that's a very valid point. I know... Um... I think it was the UK National last time. Yeah. There was mustard on practically every sandwich choice. Yeah. Um, so, yeah... Uh, question from Stu H. Do we do anything to prepare our palate ahead of tasting? We practice with some beer. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes, sometimes more seriously, we do have, we haven't done this very much, we do have a classic example at front of a flight of something unusual that has been done before. 
um, just so you, to get get people in the right tasting mindset for it. Um, but usually we're pushed for time um, to get through them. Um, and the cost of buying a lot of those gets quite expensive. But yeah, it, it, it's done occasionally uh, before competition yeah. flights. Yeah, and I mean, sometimes just at the very start of the competition day or with an exam, you might have what's known as a calibration beer where everyone tries the same beer and just throws a score out so that you can see if you're in the same ballpark as everyone, just to get a rough ballpark estimate of where you should be. Uh, it doesn't always happen by any means, but I've had it happen at one of the tasting exams I've done and uh, two of the competitions I've been at. And talking of competitions I've been at, if you get invited to judge at a competition, there's no guarantee that um, you will always be invited, even if you are a judge. There's nothing to say that if you are not a judge, you won't get invited to judge. Um, I've personally asked an award-winning home brewer whose beer I've tried and whose tastes I trust to judge at a competition before for me. He was paired with an experienced qualified judge, but... If you can demonstrate an ability to analyse beer and give decent feedback, then even if you never sit a tasting exam, you can still you can still be invited to judge at competitions. Uh, the experience of judging at competitions also varies quite dramatically depending who's organising it. Uh, last no, not last year. Last year was a wipeout. The year before, I got invited to judge at a guild competition for. Uh, Wales and West Federation, where I judged the craft beer categories. And the feedback and everything was very different there. It was just a little sticker on the back of the bottle was all the feedback you gave to the entrant. So that's why I keep reinforcing that the main thing we're talking about here is BJCP style judging but it is not the only fruit. Other, other judging is available. All right, so, so score the flavour. Good question, good question in the chat uh, about coming to agreement if you're not, if you're well out on the scores as judges. Um, usually you start by talking to each other and trying to, trying to work out what it is you're sensing differently. If you can't get it together, there is always the um, oh, title. The, the, Head the, the, judge. There, there's a head judge there who will come and be the third person to make a make a, 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 a split a split decision. Um, uh, you can sort your scores out like that. Um, it's very rare that it happens, but they're there just to do that if needed. Yeah, and at BJCP competitions, we normally say you have to be within seven points of each other. So if you were three points apart, we wouldn't normally worry yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, I have been a competition before where we had a 20 point difference and that was when we went and got the head judge and asked them to adjudicate and just give us some pointers of who may have had to move their score a bit more um so yeah that's how we come together um but yeah normally you can just sort it out between yourselves without involving anyone else and sometimes we will just literally uh, can you just try that to the judge next to us who's judging a different flight and do it that way uh, <laughs> steve cole yes you're right it was fraser with us he did he did um he did judge one flight for me at the first welsh uh, I trust his uh, senses more than he trusts them. Uh, so let's score the flavour then, shall we? We've said what it should be. We've tried the beer. What do people give it for score? Bearing in mind you've got 20 points to give it. If you give it less than 15, just give us a couple of words to say why you're knocking it down. That would be very handy because then we can talk about it. And for this type of environment, as I said earlier, your perceptions of the beer are every bit as valid as ours and everyone else here. And we can all learn from everyone because we've all got different 
tastes, different things we're sensitive to, less sensitive to. And I'm still learning every day when I'm doing this. Sometimes I will taste beer and look at it as this is what I'm getting. Other times I'll quite happily just drink the stuff. So we're seeing some scores coming in. We're getting 15 from Alan and 18 from Stephen. 17s, 19s, 17s. <laughs> Fraser, only stewards. He smirked like that. Um, <laughs> normally, that one time he did me a favour. <laughs> Stewarding is good. You only get handed samples of the good beers, not the awful ones, usually. It all depends who you're judging for. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> sometimes I'll try it, laugh, and then just hand it to the steward. Um, Letterbox yeah. Workshop says 16 will benefit from a bit more malt. Yeah, if you're getting um, if you're getting one of the samples that has got less malt character, definitely right to flag that up. I think that's a very valid reason for docking it. Alan Manley found it a little too American IPA. Yeah, possibly. As we as we've said, it is one of those beers that's in between the two styles. It I'd say it doesn't properly nicely fit in either. Um, because there's stuff in American IPA it's missing, the stuff in English IPA it's not got. So it it works both ways. It's it is, however, down here somewhere. Um Commercial examples, Thornbridge Jaipur. There you go. It is one of the exemplars of the style as far as the BJCP. As far as the judges who wrote this particular style, style guideline are concerned, it's an exemplar of this style uh, based on the samples of it they had at the yeah. time. Uh, which may be nothing like the samples we are tasting, as I did mention last time. I don't know who wrote these. Um, so it could be that their sample of it wasn't as fresh, maybe. Who knows? Uh, and when it comes to style guidelines, someone asked earlier, is 2015 the latest ones? I think Dan answered them at the time. 2015 is still the latest released version, complete version. There's been some provisional styles added since. There is some tweaking in progress at the moment. Whether that's going to be released as a 2021 or whether it's just going to be a minor update to the 2015, I haven't been told despite being um, the assistant rep for the area. So I haven't been told that much. Uh... Right, so 17 hits all the right notes. Got to be a 20 for me. This beer broke me away from the general slot beer. <laughs> it is one of those gateway beers that might get people into drinking better beer. I totally see that. Fraser only wins. <laughs> <laughs> no, sometimes he doesn't, but sometimes he wins very big, yeah. Yeah. Right, so we're getting 14s, 15s, up to 20s. I think most of them are around 16, 17. Do you think, Reg? Yeah, I think that that's, looks about right. We're getting a few lower, but I think the general feel is a bit more malt. Oh, I'm getting quite a few of those. Yeah, I mean, Sam's raised a point. He doesn't think that the can he's got is a particularly good can of it. Um, and, yeah, there's definitely some can variability going on from what people have described, from what I've described of this beer from other batches, and from when I've had it in a bar and places like that. So, yeah, there's some variability going on. Uh, it's always it's always right to put what you're getting from the beer in front of you, even if other people are saying something different. Uh, and, and I've mentioned it a few times in the past, just because I don't get something doesn't mean it isn't there. So always worth putting down. Uh, Sam's asking some technical questions about Thornbridge's brewing. Um, my answer to that is bloody huge batches and I've no idea if they license out production or blend. But um, yeah, the fact that it's everywhere is an indication to me that it's huge batches. 
know um yeah i'd say everyone who's around the 16 17 mark you're about where i'd expect to be for this beer uh if i just do that because rich has just dropped off zoom so yeah i'll totally agree 16 17 if you've put a reason for more or for less that's great because i'd agree with you uh, herman brewing reminds me why i don't brew super west coast style anymore but nice change yeah it's not a style that everyone can brew well okay so i think that's us at the top of the hour now everyone who's scoring the beer around that point you've done really well has anyone got any comments before we end just let us know how you enjoyed it what you'd like to see more of uh i'd just love to see any feedback about what you're getting out of this and how we can help you get more from it if you want more on the technical side more on the tasting side let us know in the chat and then we can see about sorting that out for you for future episodes okay so quick one from justin there you said that some of the guidelines were written against not outstanding exemplars um well traveled or not fresh does that put better beers of the style at a disadvantage in comparison not necessarily because these are just some commercial examples for people to try if they've never tried the style at all uh, every beer at a competition or judging is judged against what it says in the style guidelines not whether it's down there in the commercial examples so i mean we've gone through we've scored this beer against each of these categories and we've decided based on the consensus or average sort of scores people are giving that this is a fairly decent example of this style um so i mean in our case, we've got supposedly fresh examples of it. And I'd like to say that whoever put Thornbridge Jaipur into there as a commercial example probably wasn't in America because I don't think this beer travels that far that often. No, they're, they're getting much better. The, the, the new ones being written by people actually local to the beer style. The, the previous 2008 version a lot of them were written by Americans who tasted quite stale examples of European beers. Yeah. Yeah. Like you say, they've got a lot better and they're getting better with each iteration. Yeah. Uh, good session. Thanks, Reese. Yeah, thank you very much again to the uh, mods in channel. I don't know that they had to do anything because you're all such lovely people. Uh, da, da, da. I hope you can go on doing this type of session at BrewCon 2022. Rich actually did in-person sessions of this at BrewCon, didn't you? Yeah, that, that, that did. we did some live brew taste, brew, beer tasting last time around. Um, yeah, it was good fun. Um, it was, yeah, similar to this, but with, with people actually shouting out what they tasted rather than just sticking it in the chat. Yeah, it was it was a good time. Um we uh, last I heard, we are still hopeful that there might be a 21 BrewCon. Um, Pip was talking to a couple of people about a possible venue for November time, I think. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see if it comes off. I hope it does. I've missed everyone. And yeah. BrewCon is always so much fun. Definitely. <laughs> okay, so we'll give that... We'll give that... Um, a nail on the head then and call that the end of this episode next week i believe it's erdinger vice beer if you can get some of that i know they sell it in tesco's um i get my shopping at tesco's so that's where i'm sourcing most of these beers but i do try to make sure you can get it in at least one other supermarket as well uh, once we've gone through some of these beers that are already lined up as um best examples or good examples of a style we're going to move on to some of the more modern craft styles where the beers that are available are not such a 
a good example. Uh, we're currently looking at doing a New England IPA and I think it's a month we run out of beers that's on the list so far. But hopefully you can join us for Erdinger next week and I'll see you then, okay? Thanks yeah. a lot for joining. Thanks, Remember to hit that like button and subscribe. Thanks for watching.